gospel according to John chapter 3. Now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do the things, these signs that you do unless God is with him. Jesus answered him, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of flesh is flesh, and that which is born of spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear its sound, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the spirit, Nicodemus said to him. How can these things be? Jesus answered him. Are you the teacher of Israel, and yet you do not understand these things? Truly, truly, I say to you, we speak of what we know, and bear witness to what we have seen, but you do not receive our testimony. If I have told you earthly things, and you do not believe, how can you believe if I tell you heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven except he who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. This is the Gospel of the Lord. I think this mic works. Good? We're good? All right. That other mic, I think, was possessed by evil spirits. <laughs> so it will be... Uh, <laughs> We will, we will have demons come out at the end of service. All right. Um, this week, um, I would like to take the opportunity to um, talk about one of the most complicated um, and misunderstood doctrines in the Christian church. That would be the doctrine of the Trinity, the teachings of the Holy Trinity. Uh, not everybody in the Christian church uh, sort of buys into the Trinity. Um, that's talked about a lot in small group Bible studies. Um, last week I made a statement, this is what prompted this, uh, I made a statement about the Holy Spirit and I said the Holy Spirit and third wheel in the same sentence. And that caused a stir. And I have to tell you, I'm not saying that the Holy Spirit is a third wheel. I'm just saying the Holy Spirit is neglected in teaching a lot, and we don't really talk that much about the Holy Spirit um, in depth, and so the Holy Spirit doesn't get the airtime that the Holy Spirit deserves, and I was actually saying that, and anyway, this idea of third wheel, that somebody got stuck on it, and so I thought, you know what? I'm going to take the opportunity on Holy Trinity Sunday, which is this Sunday, and it was a perfect segue into this Sunday, to talk more about the Trinity, give you an idea of the value and the beauty of our faith. So hopefully this is not going to bore you to tears. I hope it doesn't. It's not a very long sermon, so if you, if you feel yourself eyes glazing over or you want to check your emails or something like that, I understand. All right, so um, this idea of the Trinity is often, often 
uh, misunderstood. And I think that the misunderstanding of the Trinity and what it's supposed to be is part of the reason that people have such a tough time with it. Before we get into the Trinity and why the Trinity, why does God communicate uh, to us in three persons but claim to be one God? Why do that? That just seems so confusing. Before we get into that, I would like to uh, go back to my chess days, the, the board game chess. When you get a chess opening book, usually when you buy a Queen's Gambit or a Roy Lopez or a Sicilian opening, right, they'll tell you all the other openings on the way to that opening. Let's look at alternative moves first before we get into the opening. So I would like the opportunity, some of you are like, I don't play chess. Uh, but uh, some of you who do, you understand what I mean. Let's look at some alternatives so that when we come back to the Trinity, we're like, okay, now I get the value of this. This makes sense. So here we go. Uh, we're going to look at what Christianity doesn't look like first. All right. Um, and oh, one other disclaimer I want to say. Um, I, I want to exclude the atheist sort of view of life in the sense I'm not going to go into detail with that. Um, atheists seem to appear to create this kind of religion out of government. I've noticed you get pockets of atheist communities and somehow, you know, there's always sort of a government sort of thing going on and a totalitarian sort of rule and I'm not going to get into that. So um, we'll just kind of leave that out. But among religious communities, People who are or have a faith in God, um, that is the group that I want to center in on um, for, this, for this message. Anyway, um, that's what I want to spend the majority of time on. I would say that there's three major groups that sort of parallel what we're going to talk about. Three major groups. Um, and I'm going to try to break it down in a way that you can remember it. Um, I want to start with the first group. The first group of sort of religious communities that sort of parallel what we're talking about in our doctrine of the Trinity is uh, the God out there group. We talk about it in sermons a lot here, right? You know, we talk about the distant God of, of world religions, right? The God that's way out there, right? And I would call um, this group the trapped on a desert island SOS community. Um, they're the kind of group that, that God is way out there and there's some sort of activity with this group that sort of gets God's attention, right? There's the dance around sort of ceremony. There's the building of the pyramids and shaped in the pattern or the, the marble sort of stones or sort of the Stonehenge clock, you know. It's where God can see this message. Hey, God, look at us down here. You're so far away, so distant, that we have to kind of bring you down to us. And you can see this sort of community all over, North and South America, uh, you know, Africa, even in the Nordic regions of uh, Northern Europe. There's these sort of communities that I like to call the God out there distant creator of all things out there. The next group is the opposite of this. The next group doesn't see the God way out there. The next group sees this like powerful human, right? This sort of guru teacher. This group is kind of like the, the, the enlightened one. We're going to follow, you know, Ralph. Ralph is the enlightened one. And they get in a room and they learn from this enlightened being or, or, or a human being who teaches them something. And they learn about it and there's a small group of disciples and the word spreads. And then all of a sudden, the teacher disappears, dies, as we all do as human beings. And what's left is the book, the teaching of the of the. Um, the enlightened human, and you follow the Eightfold Path, or the, the path to enlightenment, or how the, the manual on how to get to Nirvana, or whatever it is. And there's a lot of faiths like this, right? 
The great teacher teaches this thing, they write it all down, and all of a sudden we have to practice and imitate the teacher in order to get to that place. Close, but not really, right? Um, the problem with these first two that I find is they're very impersonal. This distant God, I don't have a relationship with this. I got to get this God's attention, right? And then um, the other one where there's the enlightened one, the enlightened one is gone. And then I'm left with picking up the pieces. And now I got to make it happen. And the success and failure of the religion has to do with my behavior pattern. Right? How well can I imitate the enlightened one? Right? So this is kind of the problem of the first two. The last group. The final group of the three, I would call them, and this is not to be insulting, I just, I don't have a better way of describing it so that you'll remember, but the last group is the trap in your head looking for transcendence group, right? This is like, I'm, I'm spiritual but not religious, you know, that kind of group, you know? There's like, I got this spiritual thing going on, but it's so complicated and so out of your reach that I can't articulate it to you, I can't really share it with you, it really exists in here, you know, and I'm the only one that really experiences it, and you might experience your own version of it, but it's not going to be something we share, so there's no reason to get together in the room and sing songs and praise and all that kind of, I don't need any of that religion mess, I've got everything I need in here, and that's sort of when I think about that, I think of that being very impersonal as well. It may be like, I guess to the person they have their own personal thing, but it's not shared among people. It's not something you can communicate and repeat or anything like that. So I, I have trouble with that one too. It's like, what happened to the personal relationship? Um, and so with all of these faiths, um, and all of these sort of um, views about God. Um, I, oh, one other thing I want to say about the last group that I found interesting, and I kind of threw this at the last minute. That's why I didn't just remember to say it. The last group to me is interesting because, and this might be a little controversial, but I just kind of threw it in on a Friday uh, towards the end of the week. And I have to say, I kind of see our culture today as falling into the third category. It's, it's interesting to me because our kind of media culture and everything and the way that we're shaping our minds and the way we're getting lost in our phones and lost in our fantasy world, I kind of feel the characteristics of this third group is sort of taking over the community and kind of taking over our culture. Right? Um, th this whole idea of um, what feels good versus what feels bad. Right? Good is what feels good, and bad is painful. And so there's this sort of move towards feel good and a way towards what's painful. Because nothing good can come from what's painful, right? Um, that's not our faith, but that's sort of the new way of looking at it. Medically, we, we respond that way, and psychologically, we respond that way. We're all into good feelings versus bad feelings, and we've made it that. And I feel like the characteristics of this kind of spirituality, new agey kind of thing of the past sort of has a nice marriage with the way that we relate to each other today in that way. So I just want to throw that in. I, that, that was kind of a last minute ad you can totally tell. Anyway, um, so back to the Trinity, and how does the Trinity work, and what's the value of it? Why do we believe in such a really odd, out there doctrine? And I will have to say that not everybody in the Christian church believes in the Holy Trinity. I know that sounds strange, but I've got one in my own household who is kind of 
wavers back and forth. I won't say she doesn't believe, but she's like, yeah, I don't know. I probably really buy into it. It's not quite in the Bible. And she's right. It's not exactly in the Bible as we describe it in the way we teach it. Um, but that's kind of her thing. She's not here this week. She's out of town. Mom, how are you doing? Uh, so we can talk about her while she's gone. Right? Uh, yeah. Anyway, she can't talk back at lunch today. Why did you talk about me? Anyway, um, so there's, it's not like, it's, there's various pop, um, various beliefs in the Holy Trinity. So if you kind of have trouble with it, don't worry about it. Don't go to pieces. It's okay. All right. Anyway, um, what is so great about the Trinity? Why is it such an important doctrine of the church and why has it lasted for so long? Um, answer the unique presentation of our God in the Old and New Testament is so powerful that I can see why Christianity and Christian communities have thrived so much and why our faith has survived so many generations there is something very, very powerful about the Holy Trinity. The first thing that stands out for me is that Christianity, in comparison to other faiths, it's my opinion, but Christianity, in comparison to other faiths, is extremely personal. Extremely personal and relational. I know that Christians say, do you have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ? Do you have a personal relationship? I know Christian, Christians say that all the time, right? And I, I think they emphasize Jesus a lot, but really all of God is extremely personal. There is no God out there that lives behind the clouds, that nobody comes in contact. That's not Christianity in any form, right? We have a personal God. And yes, people gravitate towards Jesus because Jesus was the one who walked on planet Earth. I get it. But all of God is personal. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit is all personal. And I hope I'm not getting too complicated. Um, I hope that this isn't getting too weird or anything like that. But um, when you look at our experience of life as human beings, we experience life through three persons. All of us do. The three persons of our inner narrative, the three persons of our, of our ability to understand history, right? The I, the you, and the them, the others like us, right? So when you look at the you, right, the not me, we see the, the vast universe, we see the, the, the creation, we see the, the God provider of all things, right? The universe moves without our permission. God does what God does without our permission. There is a higher power, and that higher power is not me. We all experience that. We all experience God's greatness without us doing anything. And guess what? We can imagine that this is going to continue when we are no longer in this body, right? We can't stop this from happening. So automatically, even if you're the staunchest atheist and you don't believe, you have some form of a belief in God. It says that in the uh, first chapter of, of Romans. You have some idea of God in a sense. So the, the great thou, I would call that the great thou, the great not me, right? You can all experience that. The next one that I want to bring about is the them, right? The them. We can perceive other eyes like us, right? I look at you and I see other eyes like me. I assume you're having a, an experience of the world that's similar to mine, right? Jesus, says how you treat them is how you treat me. 
we begin to have a relationship with each other of unconditional love through Jesus Christ, who first loved us unconditionally, who needed nothing to be paid to him, who had no debt of sin, who gave love away freely without trying to get something back in return. We follow that, we walk with that, and we have a relationship with each other because of that. And so we kind of, we look at the thou and we look at the them, and it's very much covered in the doctrine of the Trinity. And then the, the last one, obviously, is the I. The God who speaks to us internally. The God who draws us to his word. The God who communicates to us through his word. The God where we interpret his word based on the spirit that is infused in us, as the Bible says. The Holy Spirit. And so when we look at all the different persons of our experience, first person, second person, third person, God encompasses all of that. And the one God is not divided. The one God is one God. There's no daylight between persons. It's not that we believe in three gods. We believe in one God in three persons. Do you see the value of that? The one God communicates to us in three persons for good reason. So that we have a personal relationship with God. That's the beauty of our faith. One God, three persons, and no conflict between them. Now we can, we can choose to ignore the great doctrine of the church, the Holy Trinity. Because it's a little hard to get our head around, because we kind of just, I don't know, we don't understand it. Or we can see God's revelation through his word as a gift to us, and as a benefit and a blessing to us. God communicates to us in a way that we can understand, in a way that we can grow closer to him, in a way that we can understand his actions and his love and his character and his person. God wants to be known by us. God communicates his unmistakable love for his church in the best way possible. And that's what this is. So when we say the creed today, and we say the different parts of the creed, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, I want you to think about how vivid and how beautiful your God is. Both powerful and mighty, but up close and personal, in our hearts and eternal, internal in our hearts. God is in all of those places at once because God wants us to know him fully. He has fully revealed himself to us through the doctrine of the Trinity. So yes, it's not written in the Bible and you know, any sort of formula or whatever, but it's there. It's there to be viewed and there to be owned by us so that we can see our God for who our God is. Amen?